you're ready to, you could save the world uh, using Wonder Woman to teach history past and present. I'd like to introduce myself and my colleagues. This is Dylan Demers on the end here, uh, Stephen Huddleston in the middle, and then my name is Roy Joe Sargent. And we're all from the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. Um, I wanted to start just by telling you um, who we are and who we are not. Um, first of all, who we are not, we are not experts on every aspect of Wonder Woman and the Wonder Woman canon. So, um, so, so if our examples seem um, focused or, or only, if we're only using examples from certain parts of the canon, that's why. We're not experts on the entire uh, Wonder Woman canon. Um, who we are is we are historians. Um, and historians, what historians do is we look at artifacts um, to help us understand the times and the peoples and the values that created those artifacts. And this is, this is what makes us fans of using pop culture, um, including Wonder Woman, to teach history. Because you can look not only at the history that's represented by Wonder Woman, right, and in the Wonder Woman stories, but you can also look at Wonder Woman herself as an artifact. Right? So when you look at Wonder Woman through the, the decades, you can look at Wonder Woman as an artifact representing different times and peoples and values that created her. And so our goal for this session is to talk to you about how you can use Wonder Woman to teach history, but perhaps not the history you might be thinking of. Okay? Um, it would be really easy for us to talk to you about how to use Wonder Woman to teach Greek mythology or um, the history of World War I or World War II. But those are things that you've likely already thought of and that you could put together without any help from us. Okay. Uh, what we can help you with is how to think about using Wonder Woman herself as an artifact of our social history of the last century. So, for example, um, you can look at Wonder Woman of the 1940s and, and use that to, to look at, at this as an artifact of a patriotic, pro-U.S. superhero for the war and post-war era, um, but who has a subversive social justice streak. Okay. You can also look at Wonder Woman as an artifact of the 1970s, um, as an icon of um, burgeoning female empowerment and sisterhood, um, reaching even wider audiences through the medium of television. Um, and you can look at Wonder Woman as an artifact of the 2010s, Right? Uh, becoming a symbol of calls for gender diversity and equality for an international audience. And so, so our plan for today is that we're going to present these three ways to look at Wonder Woman as an artifact, 1940s, 1970s, 2010s. And then we're going to have a workshop with you at the end to talk about ways that you could implement this in a classroom. Um, and just a quick, just a quick, uh, uh, just so we can get a sense of who's in the room. How many folks in the room are teachers? Okay, awesome. How many are maybe interested in becoming a, a teacher, taking classes to become a teacher? Sweet. How many parents in the room? Okay. How many students in the room? How many folks in the room talk about cool things like Wonder Woman with folks that they know? Um, and, <laughs> ah, yes, okay, awesome. Right? And so thus everybody in this room, right, everybody in this room is a teacher um, or a student, right, in some capacity, right? Whether you're actually up in front of a classroom leading a class, right, and, and helping students learn things and work through things and come to realizations for themselves, or whether you are talking with your own kids at home, or whether you are talking with your friends. Everybody in this room has the capacity to be a teacher in some form or fashion at some point in your life, all through your life. And so I think this is going to be a really, really fun um, um, exercise for all of us to talk to kind of talk through this. We'll talk to you a little bit here, and then we're all going to get a chance to talk through it together. Sweet. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to, to Dylan. All right, so we are going to start at the very beginning of Wonder Woman. Uh, first, we're going to go over a little bit about her character and what makes her so unique in the world of comics compared to her other contemporary comics that were coming out at the time. For one, she's a woman. The first independent woman. She's not Batgirl or Supergirl. She's Wonder Woman. She's completely independent from these other heroes. And she represents something entirely different. Uh, excuse me. 
she's very unique in that her strength doesn't necessarily come from her physical strength, although she certainly has that. Her strength comes from her ability to love, compassion. She has a weapon that compels people to tell the truth, after all. She's not necessarily just using brute force to uh, win battles and that kind of thing, although she is definitely capable of it, which was important to the creators of Wonder Woman, that the character represent female values as they viewed it in the 40s, but also to represent a strong icon for girls and women and even little boys who read the comics at the time. So that's kind of a brief overview of her as a character, and now we're going to go to her early years, which would be essentially World War II, in which most comics, Wonder Woman, Captain America, Superman, are all used for essentially what is propaganda for the United States. Very patriotic, uh, encouraging you to buy bonds, help however you can in the war. But unlike Superman or Captain America, Wonder Woman also represents the women on the home front. We have Rosie the River here, famous poster. I wish I would have put it in the picture of Gal Gadot doing this, but I didn't, because it's not historically accurate to the time, but we push forward. She represented how women on the home front could be strong, they weren't fighting in the war like the soldiers, the men, their counterparts, but they were at home working the factories, tending to the family, and keeping the country going while almost everyone else was fighting halfway across the world. And of course, to go with this, she's going to fight the typical bad guys, and you can't really have better bad guys than the Nazis. So of course, those are some of the big ones for her. What's interesting is that uh, William Moulton Marston, her creator, was very protective of her. He wanted to keep her the character that he wanted her to be, which was very, very progressive for the time. He wanted her to be the strong feminine archetype. And as you can read from this quote here, he definitely wanted to kind of crush some of the existing stereotypes and myths about women of the time that they were weak. And his solution to this was to make a character strong. So in all of the Wonder Woman comics by Marston, you'll find that she's very strong. In this one in particular, uh, she says that if she were to marry Steve Trevor, that would force her to be weaker than him, and that she was not willing to do that. And that's something not, you would not have heard of in the outside of this. Except when she's in the Justice League, which is interesting. It's a very, very different Wonder Woman in the Justice League. Marston <coughs> did not want anyone else writing her, which is part of the reason for the Justice League being that she was always left to be the secretary, while Superman and Batman and the other heroes got to go fight Hitler and Mussolini in the war. Wonder Woman had to stay home and be the secretary. And here she tells you it's not do so. Although you get a very different view from Marston's own comics. So we get two kind of competing images of Wonder Woman, which shows us the tension of the 1940s. While some people wanted to push forward and start pushing these female rights and aspects, we weren't quite there yet. And it's worth studying because it shows us the social atmosphere of the time in the 40s. It shows us the propaganda of the going on, of course. It shows us Marston, who was a feminist. It's also a very interesting character in history. history. I advise looking him up. Uh, but it shows the start for the push for feminism, which we will see in a little bit here with the 1970s. But it also shows the unwillingness to keep pushing forward because of the times, because they were too scared to be too progressive. So we get these images of conflict between the two countries which are really interesting, especially if you're a historian. Um, we're going to get a more unified look for Wonder Woman going forward, though, into the 1970s as she becomes a feminist icon. And Stefan here is going to tell you a little bit about that. Oh, 
Well, so, um, I don't know how many people here have seen the 1970s when the Cardinal Wonder Woman. You see a lot of heads nodding. I grew up watching it. Like, um, it was one of my favorite shows when I was about that tall. Um, so, in the 1970s, uh, we had a lot of interesting things going on in history, and especially in the context of women and women's movements. And Wonder Woman kind of becomes a feminist icon in the 1970s. And we have um, a few things happening. So in the early part of the 20th century, we had what was uh, what has been dubbed first wave feminism, where we had women who were looking for, they were looking for equality and trying primarily, of course, early on in the 20th century to get the right to vote. Uh, was the main thing that they were seeking. When we get to the 1970s and we move into uh, into second wave feminism, we're getting a lot of other issues that start to deal with employment and reproductive rights uh, and women being able to make their own choices about what they want to do, where they want to go, who they want to be. Uh, and so we have Wonder Woman now who we kind of get this image of Wonder Woman that comes out of this second wave feminism. Where these are the daughters and the granddaughters of the women who had gone to work in World War One, World War Two, rather, in World War Two, and they had a taste of that independence. Right? They knew I can go out and I can hold a job. And of course, when all the men came back from the war, we all of a sudden got that 1950s lifestyle where you've probably seen the images, that idyllic image of mom in her high heels vacuuming the floor as if anybody vacuumed in the high heels. <laughs> um, but um, we got those crazy images of mom in the kitchen with an apron in the 1950s and things like that. And we have this thing that we're, we're going to change that. And we have now the rise of women who want to change that in the 1970s. And so Wonder Woman, we get these images where um, Gloria Steinem decides she's going to put Wonder Woman on the cover of Ms. Magazine in 1972. And as you can see here, she puts Wonder Woman for president on the cover of the magazine. And she wants this message of something that's going stronger, of a strong, independent woman who fights for equality, but who is still her own woman, who is still able to make her own choices and not have to deal with kind of a man's world. And so in an interview uh, a few years ago, Gloria Steinem was kind of asked about that time. She was really pushing DC. And throughout the 1950s, when we had that image in the 1950s, Wonder Woman had become kind of pushed to the rear. She had even lost her powers. Um, a lot of the things that she had had were taken away from her. So she was really pushing DC Comics and lobbying DC Comics to bring back the Wonder Woman that was strong, that was independent. And so she pushes them, pushes them, and we start to see a few things happen. As second wave feminism starts to get these ideas of greater identities for women, so the concept of intersectionality, you're not just a woman, you are you know, a strong black woman, you are Latino, or whatever the case may be, you have other identities involved. And so we see the rise of the character they give, uh, the character Nubia, who is um, a black counterpart to Wonder Woman. They give Wonder Woman back her, her lasso. Um, and Gloria Steinem says she likes to think that she was responsible with the lobbying that she did and the pushing that she did, that um, after this cover was Put up that the next female head of DC Comics, Jeanette Kahn, was a woman. Um, so we see she wanted something on Miss Magazine, she also said, other than just a model or a, a fashion figure that was popular on magazines in the 1970s. She again wanted something that showed an independence. We also have to note that 1972 was an election year. And it was the year that we get the first African American woman elected to Congress, um, running on the on the Democratic ticket. 
And so there are all of these things that come out of, of Wonder Woman in this search for equality. In the next one, also in 1972, we see this story in Wonder Woman in, in, the, in Wonder Woman 203 of the December issue where the primary storyline is dealing with women working at Grandy's department store pushing for equal pay in the department store at the time. So Wonder Woman starts to get involved in these issues of women's rights that are really tied up in what's happening with women's movements in the 1970s and the push for the ERA and all these other things that are coming out with the character. And so at the same time, that's when we get in 1974, as this previous slide showed, we had the Linda Carter Wonder Woman, which now opens the character up to a whole new viewership and we start to get a lot more little girls who are now exposed, little boys who are exposed to Wonder Woman, people who previously hadn't been exposed to the character in, before seeing it on television. And so the first season of Wonder Woman, they set the first season of the television show in World War II. And then it wasn't until subsequent seasons after that but they came back and set the show in modern day. But that first season being set in World War II kind of has a little significant tie-in to what we see with Wonder Woman in, in the later version of Wonder Woman that we see in 2017. There's kind of a nifty little tie-in. If you watch any of the first season of Wonder Woman, the theme song at the beginning, which later just became, had no lyrics, the original theme song contains the words, she can turn a hawk into a dove and win a war with love. So Wonder Woman is this character, again, as, as Dylan was talking about, who has the strength, but that's not her first option. Her first option is to try compassion, to try the lasso, to try things that are not necessarily, she uses a very kind of care ethics approach to being a superhero. She's not using brute strength as her first option unless it's absolutely necessary. But she has that ability, and that makes her kind of a very dynamic and multi-dimensional character because she's not just that, that one method, I'm always gonna go in and punch Nazis in the face or I'm gonna punch whoever in the face. She has these other options that she tries to resort to first, and then she has that strength, and it does become necessary. So as we look at that, in the context of 1972, we can see this change in the movements that are going on with women and the women's rights movement getting power and trying to get kind of equality in throughout American society and global society. One woman serves as a representation of that. And then, of course, as we move out of the 1970s and the 1980s, things are going to kind of start to move into the third wave of feminism, and Roy Joe's going to talk about that. Yeah, so, so in the 2010s, right, we see a resurgence um, of interest in Wonder Woman and a resurgence of Wonder Woman on our screens and in print, right? Here she is on the 40th anniversary issue of this magazine. Um, but as you can see, um, in this magazine, she is uh, racing to, to help her sisters who are calling for a stop to the war on women. And that's really what we, how Wonder Woman is reflecting um, society in the 2010s. Because in the 2010s, we see um, these calls for international gender diversity and equality. Okay? <coughs> um, it's reflective, as Stephen said, of um, third wave feminism, which, which begins um, you get, you get some very early threads of it there when in the 70s. Um, it really comes into full fruition in the 1990s into the 2000s. Third wave um, feminism is really focused on this intersectionality. It's not just about being a woman. It's about being a woman of, of a particular race or being a woman of a particular class and how all of those experiences kind of come together and shape one's experiences and shape um, the, the calls that one is making for recognition and for participation in society. Okay. Um, but also in 2012, we get the beginnings of what has now been termed fourth wave feminism, which is really focused on 
um, justice for sexual violence. Okay, and so so um, backing up just a smidgen, um, around 2010, we get we begin hearing this phrase, the war on women, and it began as this phrase began being used by women in response to um, some lawmakers. Um, attempts to limit women's reproductive rights, um, and so so um, opponents to those lawmakers called that a war on women. Right, that it, it felt like um, some lawmakers were attacking women directly, and and so there's there's been this this kind of movement over the last several years to to push back against that. Um, as as possibly as an outgrowth of that movement, we've seen sexual abuse allegations against um, kind of ho high profile. Um, potential perpetrators receive really significant attention, really worldwide attention, and that of course um, sparked the Me Too movement last fall, um, which which um, arose to draw attention to um, sexual harassment and sexual abuse issues, right? And so, so there's this conversation that's been going on, not just in the U.S. but globally, around um, around justice. And uh, recognition of, of these 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 issues that women are facing, and when Ms. Magazine puts Wonder Woman on the cover in 2012, it's not just for the 40th anniversary issue, but it's also to to stress the fact that Wonder Woman can be seen as a as a uh, defender and supporter of those women who are pushing back against those kinds of things. Okay, um, one of the other things that we see is that um, in 2017. Uh, Wonder Woman was named by the United Nations as an ambassador, um, specifically as an ambassador to, to stand up for the empowerment of women and girls everywhere. So as you see in this photo on the left, this is at the ceremony in October of 2017, announcing Wonder Woman as the special ambassador. And you see the two Wonder Women, right? They're the two most famous Wonder Women who played her um, on film and TV. That's Linda Carter on the left, and then that's Gal Gadot there on the right, right? And so they were at the ceremony um, that announced Wonder Woman as this, this spokesperson um, calling for not just American, but international gender equality and female empowerment. However, as the photo on the right indicates, there was a backlash against this. Um, and, and so it, it's a little bit difficult to see, but the, the signs that the protesters on the right here are holding from left to right, um, it says, I am not a mascot. Um, the woman in the front is holding a sign that says, real women deserve a real ambassador. And then the woman in the far right says, globally, women deserve a real ambassador. And so there was a backlash against Wonder Woman being used as as an ambassador, as an icon for empowerment, uh, because there was a feeling um, that that her appearance um, did not suggest female empowerment. In fact, the the United Nations several workers um, for the United Nations uh, circulated a petition in which they they referred to Wonder Woman as a quote pinup girl unquote, um, and they felt that that did not um, you know represent real women's experience, either for themselves or for women in the countries that they, that they worked in. Um, and and what, what this suggests to us is that, that some, some folks around the world were only seeing the surface of Wonder Woman and were not seeing these, these qualities that Wonder Woman was created to represent in the 40s by Marston, right? I mean, she was created as this subversive social justice figure who would who, who Marston continually depicts as stronger than men. I mean, she's physically stronger, right? Because she has super strength. Um, but she's also, you know, kind of more emotionally resilient, um, more understanding, smarter, right? Like Marston writes her in these ways and he, he was very explicit about saying that he wanted her to be better than men, okay? Um, and, and we see that those qualities again in the 70s um, uh, with, with Linda Carter, uh, with the Linda Carter television Wonder Woman, right, um, using these these tools of compassion and love, right, more so than her strength, as a way to to triumph over adversity and to to kind of force um, the bad guys to to recognize what has happened, right? I mean, her major weapon being being her her, her lasso of truth. It compels people to tell the truth, sure, but it also compels them to see the truth about themselves and about the world and about their actions, right? Like these are 
um, the kinds of tools that require a real fortitude, a real internal fortitude and a real strength of character to be able to employ. And, and that is something that the fans of Wonder Woman totally get, right? So, so when this petition circulated from the UN workers, um, other petitions by Wonder Woman fans sprang up around the world, including one uh, started by a 14-year-old fan in Mexico um, who, who said, quote, no matter how she is dressed or how she looks, Wonder Woman's message of peace, justice, and gender equality has always remained, right? The fans get it, right? The fans get it, but, but folks who don't know as much about Wonder Woman don't understand it. Right? And I, I actually would put myself in that category. I didn't know very much about Wonder Woman um, until, until you know, quite recently when I began to learn more about her and I was really blown away by, by these, these qualities, but also blown away by how I had completely missed that for most of my life, right? I had just seen the pinup girl, right? And so, so this, this, this whole um, controversy with, with the, the um, ambassadorship, which ended after two months, I should say, and the United Nations said that the ending of the ambassadorship was planned, um, which maybe, maybe it was, but also possibly it ended early based on the, the feedback that they were getting. Um, but this, this, just, this just indicates that, that there's still some work to be, get, to be done um, to, to get the word out about what they want, right? And so one of the things that helps get that word out is the recent film. Stefan, would you? So the recent film um, from last year, where Gal Gadot plays Wonder Woman, um, really has at its core a message of justice and equality that's aimed at an international audience, right? So we've moved on from Wonder Woman as a symbol of American patriotism, right? Um, from the 40s, right? She's no longer a symbol of America. I mean, she's not American. I mean, she never was, but I mean, she's certainly not American in this film, and in fact, she represents um, and allegiance, allegiances that cross national boundaries, right? She allies with an American, Steve Trevor, who's working for the British, right? Um, together they put together a team that includes a Scotsman, a Moroccan, and a Native American, right? And they're, they're operating in France. I mean, I mean it's, it is not about um, the U.S. and kind of fighting against the enemies of the United States. Instead, it is fighting against a threat to the entire world. And so she, she's so we're really getting this, I mean, of course, Gal Gadot is not an American actress either. So, so we're really getting this message on multiple levels there that Wonder Woman is a symbol for the entire world, right? Um, fighting against you know, enemies of the entire world, okay? Um, but the other really interesting aspect of this is, is this idea, I was really struck by it the first time I saw the movie, were you guys too, when she says, I am the man who can. Right? Like, I really liked that, that, that quote, but then I thought, wow, like, I really have to unpack that and think about why I like that and think about what that means about Wonder Woman and about the world that we live in today, right? Like, is Wonder Woman a man? Uh, is she a woman? Does it matter? Right? Um, and, and, I mean, where I'm at right now on this is, is, she is a pro she's portrayed as the appropriate person to accomplish the task at hand. And nobody... Um, in her, her, you know, her group, right, her immediate group, seems to care that she's a woman, right? Steve Trevor gets over his, you know, kind of awe of that pretty quickly. The rest of the group does too. Um, you know, people who see her displaying the qualities that are needed to do what needs to be done get over the fact right away that she's a woman, and instead they just see her as the person who, who is capable of doing the thing. Um, and thus, that, that seems to send a message of empowerment. Right, like that seems to send a message. You know, girls are awesome. Go, go, girl power, and we can get it done. Right, um, especially when you think about the fact that this is a movie that was directed by a female director, which is not common in superhero movies. Right, like none of them have been directed by women. Yeah. One, okay, um, right. So, so I mean, this is not common, and we have this strong female character behaving in in in, in ways that demonstrate all these types of strength that we've talked about. Um, in a movie uh, directed by a woman, populated by other female characters who are also totally awesome um, and strong, right? And but reactions were mixed. Okay, again, right? Same as we <coughs> see with um, with with the, the United Nations ambassadorship. Reactions are mixed. Mixed. Some people said yes, right? Yes, 
here is an empowered Wonder Woman. She is an empowered symbol for women everywhere, right? This is awesome. Other people said the representation of Wonder Woman and the Amazons in the film, um, and especially the Amazons in Justice League, but I'm not going to get into that, <laughs> right? Like, that it, that it reinforces gender stereotypes, okay? And so, again, folks are, folks are mixed on this. Um, and so what does that mean, right? What does that say about 2017 or about tw 2010s? What does that say about Wonder Woman as an artifact? Right? If we think about Wonder Woman as an artifact representing a specific time. Well, I mean, to me, that says that, that this is an ongoing conversation. There's no clear answer here, and, and there, there's, there's, there's work to be done for fans. That's you. <laughs> right? There's work for us to do in educating people about what Wonder Woman actually stands for, but, in act, but also in having conversations with people, right? What does Wonder Woman stand for? How does Wonder Woman operate as an artifact? Right? How does she represent the values, the times, the peoples um, in, in these different ways? I mean, she's going strong in the comics still, right? Um, there was a film about Marston and the inspiration for Wonder Woman that came out last year. Um, the sequel to this film um, is scheduled for release in 2019, um, and, it's and the title has just recently been released as Wonder Woman 1984. Gal Gadot is returning, of course. Patty Jenkins, the director, is returning. And the villain in the film um, is, is Cheetah. Uh, female villain will be played by Kristen Wiig, right? So, so this is pretty this is pretty go-go girl power led right to the third power. And it's pretty exciting, which means that the world wants to be having that conversation. And, and so, so this, is, this really is a conversation that's now taking place on a global level, okay? So, so what, I would, what, what we would like to do now is, is have you guys break into some small groups, like just turn to your neighbors, okay? Um, introduce yourselves, right? Like say if you're a teacher, if you're a parent, if you're a fan, right? Like, like in what capacity might you have the ability to teach Wonder Woman? Um, and think about which of these versions of Wonder Woman interests you, or which might be appropriate for you to teach um, in your, your capacity, whether that's a classroom or your family or amongst your friends. Okay. And so, so I, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna come around and, and check in with you guys and and kind of see how this is going. But we'd like for you guys to now take this and kind of think about what you might what you might be able to do with this. Okay. So, so just turn to some turn turn to some folks. Get a little bit friendly, not too friendly. Uh, get a little bit, make some friends, make some new friends, make some Wonder Woman fans. And let's talk about.